I've had a few calls from some younger investors over the last few days on like what's sort of the best practice and, and advice that I would give them. And like right now, it's just this is survival, right? So, you know, a month ago, we might have been talking about scaling, revenue trajectory, growth. And now it's like, let's make sure that this, these companies are going to be able to weather the storm, whether that storm is one month, three months, six months, 12 months, um, and try to get those companies in a place where they have enough capital to do so. That's Beth Ferreira, a venture capitalist at Firstmark. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. We live in a world of overwhelming options, and whether you're an entrepreneur, an executive, or just someone who wants to make the most out of your time and money, committing to just one thing can feel impossible. That's called FOMO, and it's short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term. And this is FOMO Sapiens, where leaders in business and beyond share how they choose what they actually want and find the courage to miss out on the rest. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers how they make personal and professional decisions in a world of overwhelming options. As I step back and survey the wreckage to date of the coronavirus crisis, I can't help but to think back to previous crises. This is actually the fifth crisis in my career that I can think of. There's probably more, but I'm thinking back to the beginning of my career, 1998, the Russian financial crisis, which tanked Brazil at the time. I was working in Latin America. Then there was the 2000 tech bubble bursting. I was a venture capitalist working in Latin America at that time. So that was kind of everything coming together there. And then, of course, 9-11. I lived in New York City at the time. And that was a time that all of us had to deal with lots of different feelings. And the economy obviously reflected that as well. Then there was a 2008 financial crisis. I was working at AIG. So my stock fell 97%. And now we are here in the current crisis. Of course, every crisis is different, but there are commonalities. And if you can learn along the way, you can actually look back for guidance as to how you should move forward from the current situation. And the current pandemic is going to play out in entrepreneurship. It's going to hit entrepreneurs and the people who fund them very hard. But at the same time, great entrepreneurs are creative and they don't give up easily and they can provide lessons to all of us about how to be resilient in this moment. To understand what's happening on the front lines of entrepreneurship and venture capital right now, I call Beth Ferreira, who's a partner at Firstmark Capital here in New York City. Now, you might remember Beth from last season of FOMO Sapiens. In fact, you might even remember that we talked about the fact that many venture capitalists and entrepreneurs today have never lived through a crisis or a down cycle because tech was pretty resilient in 2008. Well, that's about to change. I wanted to have Beth on because she and I actually worked together during the 2000 tech implosion and on September 11th, and we fought side by side to keep things afloat. I watched her up close. She's amazing, and she's learned so much since then. She actually was the COO of Fab.com, a home goods company that raised hundreds of millions of dollars and achieved unicorn status before going bust in 2015. So she has seen how hot companies can implode, and I expect we're going to be seeing a wave of that happening shortly. So Beth has a lot of great information about how we can think about what's happening, how we can manage our companies, how we can be decisive and take the right decisions that we need to take now. Then stick around for the full moment of the show where I'll talk about the best piece of advice I got this week about how to feel a sense of purpose in the middle of the current challenges we face. Now let's get on to the interview. Since Beth and I were both recording this while socially distancing, we jumped on a Zoom call. She was at home with her two kids and her husband and they were all settling into a new routine. So first things first, I asked her, how is she managing working from home? Look, I mean, for me, it's been relatively smooth. Um, but, you know, I think for a lot of people who are in situations where they're in tight living quarters or with people that they're not usually around very often, you know, with a lot of expectations and a lot of pressure around work, it's really tough. And those who, you know, are natural extroverts and have, are used to spending a lot of time with people you know, in the office and outside of the office, this is an extremely tough time. Yeah. You're talking about me, aren't you? (laughs) (laughs) So let's take everybody back to the year 2000. And for those of you who don't know, the reason that Beth and I know each other is we actually work together at a venture capital firm. It was called Chase Capital Partners and Beth worked for a division called Flatiron and they were investors in a lot of the first hot tech companies. And we were working through this boom time when it mean, seemed like everything was exploding and it was really amazing. And then overnight, you had the dot-com bubble crash and we had to clean up the mess. And that meant 
restructuring companies, firing people, shutting down companies. It was madness out there. Take us back, Beth, for the people who maybe weren't around or forgot or maybe just completely just tried to forget because it was so painful. What was it like at that point being a venture capitalist? So I think, you know, similar to right now, there was that initial shock where it was like all of a sudden everything sort of came to a halt and companies were either in the bucket of having capital and sort of had that opportunity to either use that capital more wisely or buckle down or do whatever they needed to do or didn't have capital. And there was a first wave of sort of saving those companies and getting capital into those companies. And what I think is the scarier part about where we are today is we can get through that. It feels like many of these companies are going to get through that first wave. But what does that second wave look like? And there was a whole set of events when the economy has sort of these big sort of corrections all kinds of things can happen that you can't anticipate. So whether your big vendors are sending back your your goods or your customer that had been your customer for a long time just decides that they can't do this anymore, even though it's like critical to their business, you know, all kinds of decisions that you never thought could possibly be made might might happen and then put those companies in a cash crunch, whether it's in three months, six months, 12 months. And we don't really know what the cash availability is going to be like in those periods of time. So that's, I think, what was the scariest part about that time is that you thought, right when you thought that something was going okay, there was another hiccup in the road. So as you think about your own day-to-day decisions in running your firm, are you even looking at new deals now or are you just fully focused on taking care of the companies you already have in your portfolio? When there's any sort of crisis like this, it sort of shifts a a little bit of your focus to a little more of your focus to the portfolio than to new to new companies. But we're still looking at new deals. We, you know, we're in active diligence in two companies right now, Um, and I see that continuing for the foreseeable future. I mean, we, you know, we're really fortunate that we have. you know, a strong institutional LP base and, a, you know, support around us that, and our job is ultimately to invest in new companies. But, you know, right now where there's so much uncertainty in the market, there's a lot of time being spent with our portfolio. And do you think your your, your firm was started in, right in the aftermath of 9-11? So it's a firm that that's going to come out of a crisis, actually, and your partners were around at that time. So they're, they're all of you have been investing for nearly 20 years, I guess. As you think about some of your competitors who haven't been through this before, do you think that they are reacting the same way or do you think they're reacting differently? Um, I've had a few calls from some younger investors over the last few days on like what's sort of the best practice and, and advice that I would give them. And like right now, it's just this is survival, right? So, you know, a month ago, we might have been talking about scaling, revenue trajectory, growth. And now it's like, let's make sure that this, these companies are going to be able to weather the storm, whether that storm is one month, three months, six months, 12 months, um, and try to get those companies in a place where they have enough capital to do so. And there's two ways to do that. One is to raise more capital. And then the second is to just be maniacally focused on every dollar that's going out of your business and making sure that every dollar that's being used is used in the most efficient and uh, prudent way. So let's talk about how companies should be operating right now. You mentioned that, you know, conserving cash is really important. I would say, yeah, hoarding cash, cash is king, because not only do you, do you not know when you're going to raise money again, but if you are strong and your competitors are weak, you can actually be a consolidator in the, in the industry. So as you think about the companies in your portfolio, in order to, for example, preserve cash, what are you doing right now? What t- Give us some examples of what you're seeing in the companies that, that you work with. You know, we've seen some of our companies, you know, look very closely at all of their contracts, right? And they're, you know, I think right now is a moment where you're sort of ripping up the playbook and starting again. And so that goes from your leases to, you know, whatever sort of contracts you have to run your business. Companies are taking a hard look at their um employee base and making sure that they're allocated to the most value add um, 
portions of their business and you know are they necessary i think we will see a fair number of reductions in force over the next couple weeks um you know if your company that is in that position my suggestion is to do it sooner versus later and to do it deeper than you think um the companies can be resilient around one riff. It's it's hard to be resilient against a second. Um, <clears throat> and you want to make sure that, you know, in that period of time, you're continuing to, to preserve that capital. But that's just hard decisions. It's a lot of hard decisions. Like some, you know, you it, companies that were well down the road of product development for a new product, does that make sense to continue? Does it make sense to hold? Um, you know, companies in the consumer space, should they be you know, buying inventory, should they not be buying inventory, you know, customers that have long sales cycles with their, you know, on the and you know, enterprise side, what does that look like? You know, is that revenue that they thought they could count on in six months? Is that really going to be there? And that's when those tough decisions, those every decision and every point in time where those those dollars are going out, you should be you should be thinking about it's just it's just really thinking very hard about each one of those. Yeah, this is the time to reevaluate everything, everything you're doing, whether it's your business model to who you have on your team. And I think it is true. You you mentioned companies with a product in development. You have may, maybe have spent the last year working on something and you're about to launch it. And all of a sudden, it's completely unsuitable for this market and you just have to let it go and be creative. Are you seeing in your own portfolio any companies that have surprised you and done something, made a decision that actually you know, kind of taking advantage of this opportunity to either do something good or to just grow their business. Yeah. I mean, look, there's going to be winners and, and losers in this, um, in this market. We're seeing some of our companies see a huge uptick tick in usage. Um, you know, we have a, a, a company in the customer service space that is, you know, seen record usage and signups from, you know, new companies as customer service has become, a bigger and bigger challenge for for employees, particularly as their employees can't come to work. Um, we've seen, you know, some of our commerce companies where you know people are continuing to purchase because these products are things that they need in their everyday lives, and you know, making sure that they have those. Um, and I think overall, it's sort of like we talked about cash, and we talked about. Um, sort of how to, to operate your company. But the other piece is, is how do you keep your product relevant to your customer base? So whether you're on the enterprise side or the consumer side, that story that you told them three weeks ago, or that to evoke an emotion or evoke this like urgency around the product may be different today. Um, and it, whether it's more practical or more emotional, being able to bob and weave those stories um, is super is, is super important to keep that relevancy. Now, Beth, I want to talk about communication because one thing that happens in a crisis is the FOBO can be paralyzing. Uh, economic data is is all over the map right now. We just don't know, and so as a result, it, it is tempting to not do anything and to not communicate anything. But leaders need to communicate. So. Tell us what you think uh, as you look around your portfolio. The good communicators, and that may include yourself as well. What are they doing right? The best communicators are communicating uh, transparently and often, and so making sure that you know if you have a big organization coming through and talking about what the actual implications are, uh, you see in leaders talk about the specific things that are important to their um, employee base today, like whether or not. Um, they're going to get paid, whether or not, um, you know, are there tactics on how to live in this new world? Um, you know, one CEO I spoke to today, they asked for open questions and things that people wanted to talk about. And what the number one question was life hacks on how to save money. Um, and so, you know, th this just life has gotten a little bit more practical for people and people want to feel that their, their needs are being met. And so while, you know, I think most leaders are thinking about that, making sure that they're communicating to their teams that they're thinking about that, um, in a way that is heard and, and heard often is important. 
Yeah, leaders rise to the top in a time like this. I'm thinking about, in particular, uh, our governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo. He's been governor for a long time. I never thought much about him. I always thought he was perfectly fine, but it wasn't that he was somebody that I necessarily would have put on my list of top 100 leaders. But he has risen to the occasion. And I think there's an opportunity for all of us, not just the CEOs of companies, but all of us as employees and investors and, and leaders of companies to also do that. Because I can tell you from my own experience in 2008, there wasn't good communication. I think financial services companies oftentimes struggle. It's, it's, they're great at managing money, not as good at managing people. And as an employee of a company, AIG, during that time, it was it was very demoralizing. And so, yes, we are right now in the siege mentality part of this, but we are now going to have weeks and months of transition and change. And so leaders need to be able to respond to that. And I think timely communication is really critical. How can you help the companies in your portfolio? What should they be asking for you to do for them? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, one is helping them, what I, we were talking about before on the scenario planning. Two is, you know, we are the eyes and ears for our companies in the market and seeing what's happening in the market, whether that's, you know, there's, you know, other companies are experiencing something similar or something different. Um, you know, right now there are, you know, government loans that are available and whether or not our companies are are eligible or not eligible, you know, what other like tips, tricks, tactics we're seeing other companies um, employ that we could bring back to those companies. Also from the standpoint of thinking about, you know, strategically we thought we needed to hire a CMO this year. Does that make sense? Like helping them think through being a thought partner about, is this the moment to do that? You know, those kinds of questions, we can spend, you know, a fair amount of time. And also, as these companies are thinking about reduction of forces, you know, we have the ability to help our companies do some blocking and tackling around, you know, financial analysis and things like that if they need. I don't want to spend our entire conversation focused on downside because, as we know, a crisis creates opportunity. And both of us were investors in a company back in 2000 called Mercado Libre, which was lucky because it had just raised about, I think, 20, 20 or $30 million right before the crash and also had an amazing management team led by Marcos Calperin. And that company went on to become a company that's worth, last I looked, it was $7 billion. I haven't looked at it recently. I'm sure with the crisis, it's gone down. But this is a company that became part of the NASDAQ 100, its largest technology company in Latin America. A fantastic story. And they they lived through the crisis when many others did not. So I'd love to hear from you, Beth, if you have a story in your own arsenal of a company that, uh, that, that did that. And, if, and what were the decisions they made that made them so resilient in a time of crisis? You know, I was uh, the head of operations of Etsy during 2008. We had just raised, um, we just raised some capital right before the crash. And you know, even though we had raised capital, there's lots of companies that raise capital and still go out of business during these these times. It was thinking more about the fundamentals around what are we doing here? How do we deploy our team in the best way? How do we preserve capital? And we were a pretty frugal company to start. Uh, so that was a good place to start from. But there's always that question of when you raise a pile of capital, does that sort of loosen the purse strings? And we kept them you know, after we closed, it, we closed in the beginning of January 2008, we kept those purse strings pretty tight. And so I think that helped, you know, get more momentum, time to get more momentum into the business. A marketplace is, you know, at a, you, there's always the chicken and the egg of the, the, the sellers and the buyers. And that, you know, we had time to sort of make sure that, you know, continue to scale. Um, and was you know very careful about the people that the people and the and the services and the the things that we brought around around the company from the standpoint of um, preserving capital. And you also we talked about this last time you were you were around on the show, but I I want to go back to it because you also worked at a company that completely tanked Fab.com. Yeah, not, to, not, 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 gonna, not because not, of the market, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hold back on this one. And I think what you raised, 220 million, was that the number? That was 330. Oh, 330. Um, I knew it was a, it was a, a big a, number, a factor of 11. <laughs> and um, and that company completely imploded. What were the bad decisions there? 
look, you, you, yeah, I mean, the biggest, the biggest um, overarching challenge in that business was the pace of growth. And at some point, growth for growth rate just doesn't work. Um, particularly if you're not a, you know, a pure technology company, we we're actually moving bits and pieces and needed to figure out how to make that work across 30 different categories. And then, you know, in order to get sort of a bigger TAM or bigger opportunity move to Europe and, um, you know, all of that together was just too much. And so the wheels fell off the bus pretty quickly. The, the sad part about it is you took a business that fundamentally worked in one market and, you know, with a clear path to profitability and in some cases profitable, uh, and then moved it to a market without the same playbook and sort of trying to recreate the playbook on the fly. And that just didn't work. And so um, it's a, it's a good lesson that cash can, you know, you think you have a pile of cash, but that cash can be burned really fast and much faster than you ever think. And, and there was also an opportunity at one point where we just realized that parts of the business didn't work. We still had a hundred million dollars in the bank. That's more money than most companies ever see in their lifetimes. We had an opportunity to retool the business and, you know, right size the business and continue to grow. And one of our competitors who never really raised a ton of capital is now profitable and has several hundred million in revenue and, and doing quite well. There was the, definitely the opportunity to do that. And when you, you had mentioned earlier about opportunity, I think the, the biggest opportunity in this market is to sort of really wipe the slate clean on the expectations and get to the place where there really is product market fit or products that are actually loved by your consumers and not have to worry about that month over month growth or expectations around that, but making sure that the companies are really truly working and efficient. Yeah, the frothy days are over. And if you can fail so spectacularly in a good market, you can certainly obviously fail in a bad market. So if you're overextended as an entrepreneur right now, it's time to move quickly to cut back focus on the areas where you can actually get the profitability because you don't know when you're going to have more money. Yeah. And look, that's a scary, scary place to be. If your business model is here and you really need to get to here, that's a, that's a, that's a scary thing to do, but it's, um, I think this market gives more entrepreneurs license to do that. Beth, the last time we had a crisis like this in 2001, the big response, if I think about it, was a, return to basics. Like no, there were so many companies that were so silly that were selling products nobody needed that were being valued on vanity metrics like eyeballs. eyeballs. It, was just, it was just crazy. And then people really came back and real businesses got built that have been very successful. You think about all of the companies from Facebook to WhatsApp, all these companies didn't exist back then. Looking into the future, uh, what do you think will be the change in the VC industry this time around? Well, in every market downturn, we've seen a lot of great companies come out of them. So if you think about post-2008, Spotify, Pinterest, Shopify, were all coming, you know, all came out of that period. And I think when there is that constraint in the market, it forces entrepreneurs to be... Um, much more creative and much more focused on product market fit earlier. So that sort of like sweeping, like we're going to figure it out later. Um, the later might have, it might not be immediate, but that later is sooner than, than it is right now. So I think we're going to see a whole wave of innovation uh, post this correction. And I think what we'll see is, you know, we, this is unprecedented. We have people having cocktails over zoom or, you know, video chat, we have um, more, you know, everyone's working remote. So I think there's going to be an increased number of remote working and remote socializing tools. And so, you know, the things, you know, you hear, oh, I just had a, a you know, I just had a, a cocktail session with all of my friends from college. Why haven't we done this before? Why did we wait until now? Um, so we're going to start to see um, some changes there. And I think we're also going to see some changes in sort of the 
event and lifestyle and, you know, music festival space and, you know, still having that community around it, but what does that community look like? And can that be, whether that's more frequent, whether it's in different formats, you know, and I, and I think the innovation goes from there, even from like news dissemination and how, um, you know, we'll continue to consume content, particularly in crisis situations. Those are just some just off the top of my head, but I think we're going to see a lot of really interesting and exciting businesses. All right. So we have that on, on tape. So <laughs> season seven of FOMO Sapiens, I'm going to have you back. And we're going to see if you're right. So we're holding you accountable, Beth Ferreira. Thanks so much for coming by and good luck. <laughs> Thanks for having me. FOMO. And now it's time for the FOMO moment of the show. And today I want to talk about a little moment of inspiration I had this week. So FOMO sapiens sometimes are accused of focusing on ourselves. And this is a time where we need to think collectively because there are a lot of people out there that are hurting, people living paycheck to paycheck, people who are sick, elderly, maybe can't even do their own groceries. Obviously, people like doctors, people who are providing us food, drive the subway, the Uber, all these people who are out there doing things for us. And it can feel difficult to know how to respond. How can you show your gratitude other than saying thank you? It's also easy to feel helpless when, if you're, for example, stuck at home, sort of every day starts to feel like the same. I got a call the other day from my friend, Carrie Kennedy. Carrie is the president of RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. And we were just catching up because we haven't seen each other. And she was actually supposed to come on the show any minute. We'll see when we reschedule that. But I definitely want to have her on this season. And we were just talking about the current situation. And Carrie is a really cool person. She's very passionate about human rights, taking care of other people. And she thinks deeply about how we can all take care of each other. And so she actually said to me that one thing she wanted me to share on the show with all of you is what we can all do right now to help each other. And her piece of advice for the thing that we can all do is to give blood. Hospitals are running out of blood. They're running low. It's a crisis situation. And we can all help out with that to alleviate the shortages. And right now, blood banks are actually reorganizing their operations so that they're done in a way that's consistent with social distancing and all the things we need to do to keep safe. So I thought that was a really good idea. I wanted to share that with you. If that's something that uh, has not occurred to you, maybe it's something you want to do. And in the meantime, try to find ways to help the people around you. Little ways. Uh, it doesn't have to be something crazy. But if you know somebody who's alone and needs some help, reach out. FOMO. If you have an idea for the FOMO moment of the show or you have a question, reach out to me at letsconnect.patrickmcginnis.com or send me a tweet at PJ McGinnis. Also, you can order my new book, Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice at Amazon or at my website, patrickmcginnis.com, where you can also take the official FOMO sapiens diagnostic and find out if you're a FOMO sapiens. FOMO Sapiens is part of the HBR Presents Network. Theme FOMO. music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it at Spotify FOMO. and at iTunes. And as always, you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com. FOMO.